Okay, great. <coughs> right, um, so, <coughs> so yesterday we had some, uh, some talk about the, the, the structure of instability productive GIT. And one of the things that uh, we saw was that um, to quotient unstable strata, uh, you need to be able to quotient by non-reductive groups. So today and tomorrow, I'm going to be talking about non-reductive GIT, which is a much more uh, recent theory, which is still still an ongoing area of, of research um, of various people, including myself. So um, before I get into that, uh, I'll just give you another place where uh, non-reductive groups show up, um, a sort of more uh, maybe classical style of application than, than quotienting unstable strata. So today is... Uh, non-reductive GIT. This is today and tomorrow I'm going to be talking about this. Okay, so here's a sort of uh, a classical flavoured uh, flavored application just to convince you that this is something worth thinking about. Okay, so given a vector of uh, n plus one natural numbers, we can define uh, so this is going to be a generalization of the problem of uh, classifying hypersurfaces in projective space, which we saw was one of the sort of nicest and most classical applications of the reductive theory. Um, so given one of these vectors, we can define what's called a weighted projective space uh, as follows. So I'll denote this by P A. And this thing is you take A n plus one, minus the origin, and you quotient by GM in the same way as you do to make projective space, except uh, the, the weights of the GM action are specified by this vector, um, by, this, by this vector A, okay? Um, so that's a perfectly good way to think about it. Um, another way to think about it, if you prefer, is you can think about proj of a polynomial ring, uh, except you just declare the degree of xi to be ai. So it's the proj of the same graded ring that you take proj of to get normal projective space, except I've, I've given it a funny grading, which is, uh, which is determined by this a, okay? So there's a story about hypersurfaces and weighted projective space, which is really analogous to the, the classical story. So of course, if I take a equals one, 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 then I get normal uh, straight projective space, okay? So, What's hypersurface in, in such a space? Uh, hypersurface in PA of degree D um, is, so it's the vanishing of F for, well, you, you can probably guess, uh, F in the degree D part of this ring. Where, again, the degree of Xi is declared to be AI. So it's a weighted homogeneous polynomial. Okay, and uh, the space of such things, uh, space of such things, which I'll call height D, D A. This is again a projective space because I just take uh, this vector space uh, and I, I projectivize after taking the dual, right uh, here. Okay. And this is this is isomorphic to projective space, ordinary projective space of some dimension, because it's just a projectivized vector space. Okay, right. So that's um, so far. It's sort of exactly the same as the um, the classical theory for straight projective space. So as usual, to get a moduli space of these guys, you think about the space of hypersurfaces uh, modulo whatever the automorphism group of the ambient space is. So that's all the same, but the major difference is that this automorphism group is not going to be reductive uh, most of the time. Okay, so let me just give you a quick example of that. So e.g., if I take P112, then um, this has um, uh, automorphisms that look like, uh, well, okay, so let's say I take x1, y1, and z2 as my, as my coordinates here. Um, so x1 and y1 have weight one, and z2 has weight two. 
And so I can get automorphisms of this by thinking about automorphisms of the graded ring, this graded ring here. So in particular, it has automorphisms which sends uh, Z2 to uh, Z2 plus something of homogeneous degree two. So this plus, uh, let's say, A uh, x1 squared plus B x1 y1 plus C y1 squared. So that's a perfectly good uh, automorphism of the space. And um, this, so this A, B, C, we think of as living in G, A cubed. So I've got a three-dimensional uh, G, A. And in fact, this is normal. You can just check uh, that this is a normal subgroup um, by thinking about how it acts on these hypersurfaces, if you like. Um, so the punchline of this is that the, the, the unipotent radical of the automorphism group of this space is GA cubed. So it's not reductive. If we want to construct this moduli space, we're going to have to quotient by groups that look like this. And I showed you lots of examples in the first lecture, or at least I mentioned lots of examples in the first lecture of uh, quotients by GA being difficult. Okay. So that's just a little bit of um, a little bit of flavor to give you a sense of other kinds of applications this theory might have. So let me move on to, to just reminding you about uh, what we've seen so far in, in, in uh, reductive GIT. So, so recall um, when we have a reductive group G acting on X, we have a, a whole lot of nice properties. And the whole project of non-reductive GIT is really to say, when can we have these nice properties for general linear algebraic groups? In what degree of generality is it reasonable to expect that these properties would, would still hold? Okay, so there's, there are two different cases I talked about. One is when X is affine. And in that case, we get this morphism phi, which goes from X to the GIT quotient, which by definition is spec of the invariance. Um, and this is... Uh, a good quotient. And recall, this in particular means it's surjective, it's locally spec of invariance, and we do minimal gluing. So this is a nice time kind of quotient. Um, and uh, the other thing that we see, um, this was about, this is related to Hilbert's 14th problem, which was mentioned yesterday, is that uh, if A is finitely generated, then because G is reductive, the invariants are finitely generated. Uh, so in particular, if X is an affine variety, then the GIT quotient of X by G is an affine variety when G is a reductive group. So that's the summary of the affine theory. And then the projective theory, just to remind you, if this is, if X is, is projective and G acts on X linearly, i.e. via a representation into the vector space overlying this projective space, um, then we have uh, a few things here. So we get a projective good quotient of uh, the semi-stable locus. So this quotient is now proj of invariance. Um, uh, and remember, the semi-stable locus is some open subset of X, we get a uh, quasi-projective geometric quotient of the so-called stable locus. So this is inside here, and this is inside here, um, where uh, the Stable locus lives inside the semi-stable locus and may be equal to it if you get lucky. And the third key property that I want to remind you of is the Hilbert Mumford criterion, which says essentially that both XSS and XS can be computed. Um, uh, and they're determined by um, the two ways of thinking about it that I gave are either you can think about 
one parameter subgroups, uh, or you can think about it in terms of weight pictures. So either you uh, you say for every one parameter subgroup, you want the Hilbert Mumford criterion to have the correct sign, the Hilbert Mumford function rather to have the correct sign, or you say um, I draw the this convex hull and I need the origin to be inside for every point of the g orbit. So in particular, this uh, allows you to calculate these loci without computing invariants. Okay, so that's all the uh, the nice stuff that we saw on uh, Tuesday about reductive GIT, and these are the properties that we're going to we're going to hope for in the non-reductive world as well. Okay, <clears throat> uh, but we've already seen uh, that these can fail. These can all fail um, for a general. Uh, linear algebraic group H. So just to remind you, we've got uh, Nagata's famous counterexample to Hilbert's 14th problem, which tells you that the invariance um, may not be finitely generated, even if it, even if um, the algebra you start with is finitely generated. Um, there are various other counterexamples um, that are simpler than Nagata's, but Nagata was the first, so I'll just talk about that one. Um, <clears throat> the other thing we saw was that the image uh, of the map you get from taking spec of invariants uh, uh, may not um, uh, be a scheme. In particular, the map the map may not be surjective. Um, there's no guarantee that the map is surjective. So when I was talking about reductive GIT in the second lecture, I showed you some um, algebraic properties which come from the nice representation theory of reductive groups which guarantee that this map is subjective so the fact that we don't know it's subjective means the image could just be some constructible set and that's obviously bad independently of the fact that you know we want quotient maps to be subjective that that's definitely a reasonable thing to want um so for the non-surjectivity you can you can recall um the action of ga on sl2 um and then the quotient is not subjective. Okay. Um, so the third thing is that the invariants uh, may not separate closed orbits. Um, and the fourth thing is to do with the Hilbert Mumford criterion. So <clears throat> if we want to generalize, if we want to uh, to have a version of the Hilbert Mumford criterion that works in complete generality, we can say immediately that this is just never going to happen. And the reason um, is that we may have no uh, non trivial uh, maps from GM into our group. Um, so if H is unipotent, uh, so therefore, if it if it looks like a, a closed subgroup of um, upper triangular matrices in GLN with ones on the diagonal, then there are no non-trivial maps from GM, right? Um, so there's really no uh, no there's no hope of a Hilbert Mumford criterion in general, at least if we want it to look exactly like the reductive case. Okay. So this all looks pretty bad, right? Um, one thing to emphasize is that I, I guess because of Hilbert's 14th problem, the, the non-finite generation of invariants tends to be the thing that most people know goes wrong for, um, for non-reductive groups. And uh, I, want to, I want to stress that even if the invariants are finitely generated, uh, which does happen, um, all of these other things are still a problem. So it's not the case that, you know, if the invariants are finitely generated, then you just, you're completely home free and it's the same as reductive GIT. That's not the case at all. So these are in some sense, independent problems that you have to solve. Okay, so clearly we're gonna have to impose some kind of additional structure, some kind of additional assumptions. Wow. Um, we're gonna, okay. So let me talk a bit about what the, what the strategy is here. 
And the strategy is going to use this structure theory of linear algebraic groups that I mentioned in the first, uh, the end of the first lecture. So if I have H a linear algebraic group, then it's isomorphic to a semi-direct product of U and R, where U is its unipotent radical. Uh, and R is reductive. Right? So the idea of non-reductive GIT, or the way that people generally do these things, is if you have H acting on some algebra A, then because uh, U is normal, because it's uh, on this side of the semi-direct product, it's a normal subgroup, the unipotent radical is normal, then I get an action of H mod U on the U invariance uh, in A. And this thing is isomorphic to R because H is this semi-direct product, right? So the point of this is to say, if we could work out how to quotient by unipotent groups, then we would stand a good chance of being able to do arbitrary linear algebraic groups. So it's by no means um, the case that this would be this is the only way to proceed, but this seems like a pretty good way to proceed. You sort of reduce to unipotent groups and, and hope that you can form your quotient by first quotienting by the unipotent radical and then quotienting by the residual action of R, which is reductive. So we know how to do that using Mumford's theory. Okay, so that being said, it's worth thinking carefully about what actions of unipotent groups look like. Okay, so here's a theorem which is uh, a first step in that direction. It's a theorem of Rosenlicht, and it says, if U is unipotent and acts on uh, X quasi-affine, I mean, you can just read affine if you like. All orbits are closed. Okay. So you might think that that's a good thing. You might think that would make life easier because what we saw in the examples in the first lecture was that one of the problems that we have is that if the orbits are not closed, we have to do some sort of complicated gluing process, right? So you might think that, oh, great, actions of unipotent groups are nice because you know, they have closed orbits if, if, uh, if X is affine. Um, but in fact, this sort of works against us, annoyingly. So a corollary of this is that if phi from X to Y um, is a good quotient, a good U quotient, where U is unipotent, uh, then uh, it, 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 it must be geometric. Because in a good quotient, the only things you allow to glue together are things where orbit closures meet. And so if all the orbits are closed, then it's for free a geometric quotient. Um, so what this is saying is that uh, geometric quotients are the only game in town. Either we get a geometric quotient or it's, it's, not, it's not a good quotient. Um, so what this means is um, we have to impose um, uh, a stabilizer condition. We have to impose a constant C, constant C of the dimension of stabilizers in U uh, X over all X in X. And the reason is that um, you can't have a, a geometric quotient where the stabilizer dimension is varying. And if you can't have a geometric quotient and the group is unipotent, then you can't have a good quotient. So if we want good quotients, then it's just not going to. So I said that we need to impose structure. We need to make additional assumptions on the groups and the group actions in order to uh, have any hope of having a, a, a geometric invariant theory that's going to work for more general linear algebraic groups. And, that, and that's two things. One of these things is this stabilizer condition. And... Um, uh, but there's another one. Okay, so suppose we make this assumption. So for the purposes of these lectures, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to worry about imposing constancy of dimension of stabilizers. I'm just going to assume the stabilizers are trivial. I'm just going to talk about free actions. Um, if the uh, stabilizer dimension is, is constant, but not zero, dimension of the stabilizer is constant, but not zero, then there are things you can do. Um, but it's a little bit more complicated, and uh, I don't have time to get into that. Um, 
okay, so suppose we make this assumption that the stabilizers are trivial. Okay, but I showed you an example in the first lecture, um, which shows that even if all the stabilizers are trivial, that's still not enough to guarantee good behavior. Um, so even if the stabilizer in U um, is always trivial for all X in X, um, we uh, can't guarantee good behavior. Right. So in other words, making assumptions on the stabilizers is not going to be enough. We need another thing, right? We need another thing. And um, the thing is really the hero of this whole story, right? This is the one concept which I would say is the um, the crucial concept that makes non-reductive GIT work. So it's if you, if you remember only one thing about non-reductive GIT, maybe maybe it's the fact that this concept is the thing that that, that makes it all work. Okay, so let me give you a, a definition, and it's the definition of a, a graded unipotent radical. So it's a little bit um, opaque at first, but um, I'm going to talk more about this concept over the rest of this lecture and the um, uh, the final one, and so. Hopefully by the end, you will really appreciate what this concept is and what it means. Okay, so um, a linear algebraic group H, which recall we can write like this, um, we say it has graded unipotent radical. Uh, if there is a one parameter subgroup into the center of R, uh, such that uh, the the adjoint representation um, lambda, the image of this thing, so the this acts on the Lie algebra of U. Essentially, it's conjugation. Um, it's the infinitesimal version of conjugation. Um, so this is a this is a GM, and because this thing is normal, we have uh, an action on here. So this here becomes a finite dimensional representation of GM, where we've chosen this GM, right? So this action is going to have weights, and those weights are all going to be integers. And the condition is that we want all those integers to be positive. Okay, so, so that's the definition of graded unipotent radical. And the, the, the reason for the, um, the nomenclature, the reason why we call this a grading, um, uh, clear probably tomorrow when, when I talk more about the sort of affine, uh, the affine case, because in the affine case, it really is, uh, it really is a grading in the appropriate sense. Okay, so so let me give you a, a sort of example of this to, to, to make it more concrete, perhaps. Okay, so if H is inside GLN, uh, and it's embedded such that the unipotent radical is inside UN, the upper triangular matrices with ones on the diagonal, um, and this lambda is sitting inside, um, is sitting inside GL, um, uh, diagonally with um, strictly decreasing weights, uh, then lambda grades u. And so, you know, the reason is that if you've got something that's diagonal, then you're uh, looking at the weights on the ij entry, say, and that's going to be. Um, uh, the difference between the two weights. So if um, if the weights are decreasing, then you'll always get something positive. So that's the that's the the the, the example to keep in mind if you want something really concrete, sort of in coordinates. Okay. Okay. Um, and the first question about this is, well, okay, how common are these graded unipotent radicals? Is this something that actually happens? So in um, in HKKM strata, what I talked about yesterday, lambda beta does indeed grade. Uh, u beta, which is the unipotent radical of um, p beta. Okay. So you can see this in um, uh, if g is SL, then you get something where lambda beta can be chosen to be diagonal with decreasing weights, and then u beta will live inside the um, upper triangular matrices um, that uh, are sort of moving backwards in the weight filtration of lambda. So for Whenever you have an HKKN stratification, this instability stratification coming from uh, coming from reductive GIT, you get this grading, and so that's that's handy. Um, 
another example is um, the uh, this hypersurfaces in weighted projective space that I that I mentioned. So, ought P A has graded unipotent radical. So this is a fairly common thing that happens. I mean, if you have a um, if you have a, a, a non-reductive GIT question, which is coming from a, a moduli problem, it's, it's fairly common for this grading structure to, to be present. And if it's not, there are things you can do. For example, suppose you want to just quotient by a unipotent group. I told you that a unipotent group doesn't have uh, any homomorphisms from GM, so it doesn't have a grading, as it were, internally. But you can you can sort of add one externally and take a product of your space with P1. So you sort of add a dimension and lose a dimension. And so anyway, there's some tricks you can do if you don't have this grading in your group um, to sort of put it there. But in the examples that I'll talk about, it will always be there. Okay. Okay. So <clears throat> this this grading condition is the um, is the thing that I need to state the uh, the main the main theorem of non-reductive GIT, which sort of uh, is to non-reductive GIT what Mumford's um, projective GIT theorem uh, from Tuesday is to the reductive case. Okay. So, um, and this is called the U-hat theorem. Okay. So the setting here is we let H um, uh, a linear algebraic group have um, a greatest unipotent radical. Graded by some lambda. Okay, and and we suppose um, that this H is acting linearly um, on some projective variety. Um, via, um, you know, so recall linearly means via a, re a representation of H into uh, GL uh, M plus one. Okay, so I need a couple of pieces of notation um, uh, before I can state this theorem. So, um, in fact, let me give notation here. So I'll call this GLV. So V is the is the vector space who, which you projectivize to get this. Okay, so I get a representation of H. Uh, which is V. Okay. Um, so then write V min um, for the uh, the minimal lambda GM weight space. So if you just restrict this representation to lambda, then you get a decomposition of V into a direct sum of weight spaces. Each of these weight spaces is indexed by a weight of the GM action, i.e. Um, a number. And V min is just whatever the minimal number is. You just take the direct sum of all those minimal ones. That gives you some vector subspace, subrepresentation for GM. Okay. So now um, we can define Z min to be the intersection of this with X. So I take X and I intersect it with the projectivization of, of V min. And this is going to sit inside X as a closed subvariety. So this is going to be projected, okay? Um, and then I'm also going to define what is traditionally called x naught min, which is a set of x in x such that when I take the limit under the grading one parameter subgroup, I end up in z min. And this is open in x. And I naturally have a map from here to here, uh, p lambda, which just takes uh, x to the limit under lambda. OK, so this should um, remind you of uh, Z beta SS and Y beta SS from last time. I had this map uh, P beta. Okay. And indeed, this is, um, this is roughly what you get when you, um, when you make these definitions for um, uh, for the HKKN unstable strata, really, the, the, the appropriate thing to put here is really is really a closure of this, but that's just um, that's not important. Okay, so let me let me draw you a picture because somehow it's handy to have pictures. So 
let's say I've got Z min here, and then I have um, this other bit, which is sort of at infinity. And then I've got these fibers flowing down uh, under the, uh, taking the limit as T goes to zero under lambda. And so everything apart from the stuff at infinity is X naught min. So that's the picture. It's like a BB stratification for the GM action that you get from the grading one parameter subgroup. Okay. Um, okay, and then finally, just one more piece of notation um, that I need. Um, U hat, it's called the U hat theorem. U hat is by definition, I take U and I take the semi-direct product with respect to lambda with GM. So in other words, I, I look at the conjugation action of, of, um, of lambda on U, that gives me a, an automorphism of U because U is normal and I form this semi-direct product. So this is a subgroup. It's a subgroup of H. So I've I've taken the unipotent radical of H and I've borrowed a GM from, from, from the levy. I've borrowed this GMs from R and I've sort of stolen it and made this group here. Um, and the point really is that the presence of this uh, grading GM is, is going to make the representation theory of U behave itself enough that we can actually hope to um, uh, to get a nice quotient. So I, I suppose the point is that um, this thing is like here to tame the representation theory, make it nice. I don't mean that in any technical sense. I just mean it makes it nice in a sense that will be precise later. Okay, so now I've got a whole bunch of notation on, on the uh, on the screen. So I can, I can state this theorem. Okay, and so this theorem is um, due to uh, Greg Berksy, um, Brent Doran, Tom Hawes, and Francis Kerwin. Um, in about, I would say about 2016, some, sometime around then. Okay, and it goes like this. So X is uh, irreducible projective um, with linear action uh, of H um, as above, graded by U, uh, by lambda, sorry. Okay, and then we make this assumption. So I told you that we needed to impose two types of structure to make this work. One was the grading, the other was the stabilizer assumption. So we're going to add this assumption star, which is that um, stabilizer in U of Z is trivial for all Z in Z min. So when I take a point in this open part of X and I flow down to here and I look what happens to the U action on that point, I don't want it to have any stabilizer. That's my um, that's my stabilizer assumption. Okay. So this is equivalent um, to requiring there to be no stabilizers on no U stabilizers on X naught min, but it's sort of neater to write it like this. So people generally do. Okay. So what does the theorem tell you? Well, essentially, it tells you that you have everything you could possibly want. Um, so let me write that all down. So first of all, there exists a projective geometric quotient. Um, of this stable locus, the U hat stable locus, which by definition is X naught min minus the U sweep of Z min. And this goes to X GIT quotient of, of, of U hat, um, where this thing here um, is proj of invariance um, uh, with respect to a certain uh, uh, let me write it in blue. A certain well adapted linearization. So um, this well adaptedness is sort of a technical point that um, is not um, uh, it's not necessary for me to get into too much detail about it. But I'll just draw you a picture so you can have some idea of what it means. Um, it means that when I look at the weight picture for um, for the grading GM, so this is the weights of lambda, then I want to have um, I want to have one weight, the minimal weight, which is negative, and really, really, really close to zero, okay? And all the other weights have to be positive. So this is like at, I don't know, minus epsilon, if you like. Um, 
and exactly how small epsilon needs to be depends on uh, the degree that some ring is generated in, blah, 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 but it, it, it's not super important. The point is there is some linearization, which if you take project invariance with respect to this linearization, you get this nice uh, quotient, which is both projective and geometric, right? And moreover, this stable locus, it has a, it has a nice description, right? I've told you explicitly what it is. Um, so you should think of you should think of this as like a Hilbert Mumford criterion for U hat. And indeed, if you write down, if you unravel what the Hilbert Mumford criterion would be saying for U hat, um, it would it would give you exactly this locus. So everything works really really well. Okay, so that's for that's for U hat. But I really wanted a quotient by H. Um, well, I told you that you can just if you quotiented by U, you can sort of follow that up by a quotient by the reductive uh, part. And indeed, that's true. So you obtain um, a good quotient um, of this, what I'll call XSSH. Um, and so, yeah, you just take the U hat quotient, which is recall projective, and then you quotient that using Mumford's GIT by this R mod lambda. Um, and this thing is X. This is the GIT quotient of H uh, by definition, if you want, where um this this GIT quotient uh, is also proj of invariance um with respect to the same the same linearization this well adapted thing okay um okay and there is also I'm not going to write it down but there's also a third part which says that you know you get a um a quasi projective geometric quotient of a certain stable locus in here so it's exactly the same statement for um, that you see in um, in uh, in reductive GIT. Okay, very nice. So um, let me say a word or two about the proof of this. Um, so I'm going to abbreviate uh, these names to BDHK for the purposes of uh, brevity. Um, so the proof goes sort of like this. So you take your X and you take an appropriate uh, Veronese embedding of it into some projective space where W is, um, I take the spatial global sections of OX S um, for some S really big. And um, I have X not min mapping to X not min mod U living inside projective space on, now I take the U invariant. So I take the U invariant sections here. Uh, and I dualize. Okay. And this map here is just a linear projection. So um, this thing here, the U invariants are a subvector space of, of all of the sections of this line bundle. So when I dualize, I get a, uh, a projection going the other way. And I can induce a linear projection of, um, uh, of projective spaces that way. And the first part of the proof tells me that when I do that, um, this gives me um, this gives me this. Uh, this U quotient, which is geometric. So the first thing you do is you construct a U quotient, which is which is geometric. Um, so that's the first step. Um, and then the, the second step is um, you then apply um, uh, reductive GIT to. So so this thing is not projective. This this thing here is not projective. That's important. Um, so what you have to do is you have to take the uh, the closure of it. So take x not min mod u, you take the projective closure inside this space here. Um, yeah, so this lives inside here as a um, as a projective variety. You, you do reductive GIT to it. Um, and of course, because you've taken the closure, you have to be careful because you don't want stuff that was not in here to end up in your eventual quotient. Otherwise, you wouldn't be getting a quotient of x. You'd be getting a quotient of x plus some other stuff that just randomly came from somewhere. OK. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm massively simplifying the proof here. The proof is, 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 uh, is fairly uh, involved and intricate. And there's a lots of very clever stuff that goes into it. You need to know about things like enveloping quotients. And um, it, it, it's, a, it's a pretty intricate piece of work, I would say. But this is the, this is the, the headline gist, OK? Um, so, so one thing that I'm going to do um, tomorrow is give a different proof of this uh, theorem uh, that that is, um, uh, I suppose, shorter and and avoids 
having to know about things like enveloping quotients and all of this sort of very technical stuff. Uh, okay. Um, so that the uh, the obvious uh, question here at this point is I haven't told you what this is, right? So for you hat quotients, I've said, this is the locus you get a quotient of. Um, here I've just said, this is just some open subset of X. I have not told you what it is. So you want a hilbert Winford criterion. You want some way of determining what this is. Okay. So let's talk about that a little bit. So what is this locus? Um, I.e., do we have a, a hilbert Munford criterion? Okay. Um, so let me give you just one more piece of notation. So if we write Z min SS for the semi-stable locus um, of R mod lambda acting on uh, Z min with respect to uh, what I'll call the uh, borderline linearization. So the borderline linearization is, uh, you can think of it as the thing that you perturb to get the well-adapted linearization. So this has lowest weight zero and the, and the rest of the weights all positive. So these are, the, these, are the, these are the lambda weights. So the minimal weight is zero and the rest are strictly bigger than zero. So that's the borderline linearization. So I haven't talked much about twisting linearizations by characters, um, but if you know about reductive GIT, you know that this is a thing you can do. Um, so it's not, um, it's not something that's uh, really crucial for me to get to now. The point is this is a linearization you can always produce uh, without, a, without any problem. And you want this thing to be the semi-stable locus. So this, this really should remind you of Z beta SS. I mean, that's kind of why the notation is chosen that way. And indeed, this is, this is exactly the analog of Z beta SS. Okay. Um, so let me just make a quick remark here. So this condition on stabilizers uh, can be weakened. Um, I, you still get um, part two of the, in the theorem, i.e. the H quotient, if uh, the stabilizer in U of Z um, is only trivial um, on Z min SS. And the moral reason for this is that everything that's not in here is going to end up being unstable when you take the H quotient. So it sort of doesn't, um, you don't have anything missing from the H quotient, but you don't get a projective U hat quotient. You just get a, a quasi-projective U hat quotient, but then you get a projective H quotient. Um, you can also weaken this in other directions, um, uh, which uh, gets a little complicated depending on whether you're talking about reduced schemes or not. So I'm, I'm not going to get into that. Um, but okay, so let me let me return to this question. Right. So let me just draw a picture. So so I, the the proof the reason I got into this was because I want to I want to sort of show you how the the question about the Hilbert Munford criterion really comes down to understanding this sort of representation theory. So that I've told you that the, the GIT question uh, by you really is you you take this thing and then you project onto the U invariance. So what that means in terms of representation theory is you have a bunch of weights and then you, you sort of throw away all the weights which are not U invariant. So let me draw a picture um, of that. So what is the weight picture gonna look like for a maximal torus of, of R? Okay, so um, it's gonna look something like this. Um, okay, so let me draw the weight polytope of Z min. So points in Z min are things which are fixed by lambda with minimal weight. So you have to imagine this blue thing, apologies about my terrible drawing, but you have to imagine about this, this blue thing is, is sitting just underneath the XY plane. So it's at sort of height minus epsilon, something like that. That's what well adapted means if you think about it. It means that the minimal weight for the lambda GM, which is this direction, the minimal weight is sort of minus epsilon. So this, this blue thing is sitting just below the XY plane, right? Um, so I have this, you know, and then, and then I have maybe a bunch of other weights which are not in Z min. So I don't know, it's whatever, some picture like this. Okay. So this is the weight polytope of, um, say, a point X in, in here, right? With respect to a chosen maximal torus. So um, 
what happens when you do this, when you take the U quotient, is you just throw away the weights that are not U invariant. And the crucial thing that makes the Hilbert Mumford criterion hard is you do not know which weights they are because you cannot really feasibly compute invariance. So you don't know which things are U invariant. So what happens is when you, when you take this projection here, that's a U, you end up with um, the same picture. So um, like this and um, so you can show using the representation theory, and this is really what the grading condition does for us. You can show that all the weights in Z-min are U invariant for free. And the reason is somehow that the U action has to push them down into lower weight spaces, but you're already in the lowest weight space. So you just have to be killed. You have to go to zero, which means you're invariant. So, so all this to say that the blue stuff is gonna be the same between these two pictures, right? However, the red stuff, you just have no idea. You just, you just don't know what happens. So like any one of these weights that I drew, they might be there, they might not be there. It's just not really possible to say. Um, so this is, the, this is the weight picture in, in this space where, where I've got um, the U here. Okay. So let me just write down what I said. So Z min, um, Z min's weights are U invariant. So they're still there. Um, this is because um, the grading uh, pushes them into lower weight spaces. Um, so if you've ever done um, uh, you know, representation theory of SL2 or something, you've seen these things where you, know, you, you act by something which has a particular weight for the Cartan and you start in some weight space of your representation, you end up in that weight space plus whatever the weight of the uh, the algebra element you acted by was for the Cartan. And it's the same thing. You're kind of pushing yourself down. Um, so this is sort of mimicking mimicking that, I guess. Um, I.e. it's like, um, you know, some eta is going to move you from W alpha to, oops, to W alpha plus gamma, where, you know, um, if this is in here of weight, um, gamma and the weights will all be positive right so if i act by something which is a weight vector for the action of gm then it moves me along moves me along like this okay so i have to be moving up here which means in the dual i have to be moving down i'm already in the minimum so there's nowhere for me to go so i have to be in the kernel and being in the kernel means being in the kernel infinitesimally means you're invariant okay so the, the point of this was to try to illustrate the difficulties involved in proving the hilbert for criterion um using using this proof um, but there is one thing you can say straight away, um, which is an observation made by the people who proved the U-hat theorem, and that's if um, if you have this, semi-stability equals stability for Z-min, then you can immediately say what it is. So this is just, you take the pre-image of the stable locus uh, under under P, and you remove the U-sweep for Z-min, F-S. Um, so why is that? Well, um, imagine this this picture here. So I've conveniently I've drawn it so that this is this is true, right? So I have a, a co-dimension one holotope down here, and recall I need the origin to be contained in the convex hull of the weights. So I know that I still have all of these, and as to these, I don't know what's going to happen. Some of them will disappear, and some of them won't. However, I know that the U quotient is geometric. That comes out of the proof, right? So that tells me that at least one of these weights has to survive and still be here in this picture because if i'm not in the u sweep of z min i can't end up in the i can't end up in the same place that something in the u sweep of z min would end up in because the quotient's geometric so if i have you know this kind of picture and i'm not in the u sweep of z min then when i take the image i have to have at least one weight still here like let's say it's this one and then i just look at what the weight polytope is and i can easily see that because this blue thing is full dimensional and I have one weight which is off that hyperplane, plane, I know that the origin is going to be contained in the convex hull. And that's because I put this blue thing very, very close to the origin and slightly below it. So that's the kind of convex geometry reason why um, in this case, you get the Hilbert-Munford criterion. Um, however, 
um, you can still prove the Hilbert Lipper criterion. So it is still true. Okay. Um, um, so uh, one can prove that, um, that with assumptions as in um, the U hat theorem, um, uh, you get uh, the Hilbert Munford criterion. Um, so I'm not going to write out what it is, but it is literally verbatim the same. Um, you you define the Hilbert Munford function for one parameter subgroups in exactly the same way, and you want the Hilbert Munford function to be uh, positive for all um, uh, one parameter subgroups. Or equivalently, you can use the convex hull characterization, and it works exactly the same. Um, so that's that's pretty cool. Um, and, and proving it in the case where you don't have this condition is a little bit more difficult. You have to use some uh, some representation theory to, to make it work, but um, in the end, it does. So to summarize, we have pretty much uh, pretty much what you want uh, in this case. So the presence of a grading gives you um, uh, gives you more structure on the representation theory. The stabilizer assumption more or less has to be there. Um, and if you have both of those two things, then you get a projective ge geometric U hat quotient and you get a good quotient of a semi-stable locus determined by the Hilbert Lofer criterion. So brilliant. That's that's pretty much everything that you get in reductive GIT. And it's all still there, uh, despite the um despite the absolute mess that you get if you think about general linear algebraic groups, right? So the the, the take-home message here is that the grading makes your life a million times easier. That's the uh, that's the point, really. The, the, the grading is, is really the hero. It's what's doing doing all the heavy lifting for us and making life tons, tons easier. Okay. So um, in, in one sentence, I suppose, what I've said is that if you have a grading and you have reasonable stabilizer conditions, then the non-reductive GIT works the same as reductive GIT. Um, and there are lots and lots of cool applications of this, uh, some of which I'll probably mention next time if I have time. Um, one of them is uh, HKKN strata, um, unstable strata and reductive GIT problems. And that itself is a kind of whole family of applications because it says whenever you set up a moduli problem using reductive GIT, you can try to quotient the unstable strata and get what we call moduli spaces of unstable objects using non-reductive GIT. So that's a whole exciting family of applications that you can apply to any reductive GIT problem you like. You can apply it to um, you can apply it to modulite coherent sheaves, modulite hypersurfaces, modulite curves, whatever you want. Um, so that's one family of applications, the unstable HKKN strata. And then um, there's also, you can think about hypersurfaces and weighted projective space. As I said, um, those things have graded unipotent radicals. So you can try to apply the theorem. And, um, uh, and there are others as well. Um, one thing I will say is that um, a, lot of the, a lot of the applications do not satisfy uh, do not satisfy um, this condition here. So um, uh, the moduli of unstable sheaves of fixed hard narrow semen type definitely does not always satisfy this condition. Moduli of hypersurface and weighted projective space does not satisfy this condition. Um, so uh, there are various sort of kind of I guess enhancements, adaptations, generalizations, whatever you want to call it of this theorem, which allow you to tackle those applications. There's still some work to do, um, but the basic idea of this theorem is what is doing most of the work uh, in those applications. Okay, so um, what I'm going to do next time is I'm going to sketch out a nice proof of this U hat theorem, which is different from the one that was given in the um, BDHK uh, uh, papers. Okay, so um, next time. Right, so um, we'll give a uh, another proof of the hat theorem um, uh, using um, twisted affine GIT, um, and this um, this idea, the, the the idea of using twisted affine GIT, um, uh, this idea is due to uh, David Ridd. So the proof that I'll give is um, is, is is just following an idea uh, that he uh, told me about. Okay. Um, 
right. Um, so let me just say what twisted affine GIT is in the last few minutes, and then I'll and then I'll close. Um, so I talked about affine GIT and I talked about projective GIT. There's actually a whole. It, it's actually very general. You can you can take whatever kind of variety or scheme you want with a, a line bundle, and you can you can try to uh, take quotients. And um, this is a uh, this twisted affine business is a special case of, of that, but it's 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 worth considering as kind of its own thing. Okay, so so given G uh, reductive acting on X affine uh, and a character pi, so a holomorphism from G to GM, um, we can say that uh, F in A is chi to the n semi invariant if it's invariant sort of up to uh up to chi so g on f is i do chi to the n on g uh times times f uh for all g and g okay so this is sort of like a twisted invariant okay and then we can denote by um a chi to the n the set of semi invariants Uh, uh, with respect to chi to the n. Um, okay, and the point is that you get a graded ring this way. So you get a graded ring, you take the direct sum over n greater than or equal to zero of a chi to the n. Um, and this ring is isomorphic to, another way to think about this ring, if you like to think about invariance instead of semi-invariance, is you can take a, you can enjoy a formal variable, and you could ask for G invariance where um, uh, G acts on the variable W by, uh, I think I need it to be chi inverse for this to work. Um, so in fact, let me write it like this, it acts on W to the N by chi to the minus N. Okay. And then you can consider um, the inclusion, just like you do with normal GIT, you can consider the inclusion of the invariance to the full uh, thing. And this yields um, a twisted affine quotient um, quotient map. Um, so this is going to be we're going to be applying proj, which means we're going to get a rational map uh, to this thing, which I'll denote GIT quotient with a with a chi. So this is by definition proj of um, this ring of semi invariants. So when I say proj. It needs to be a graded ring, and the grading is 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 given by the the n, right? Um, so this quotient um, is projective over um, spec a g, and um, uh, King showed that um, um, the uh, domain of definition. Uh, which is written x chi ss. So this is just the set points in x where there's a non-vanishing semi-invariant. Uh, uh, this is given by, uh, a, uh, let's call it a variant of a Hilbert Mumford criterion. Okay. Um, so next time I will, uh, uh, talk more about U actions and such things as locally impotent derivations. Um, and, uh, by the end, hopefully I'll give you a, uh, a sketch proof of this U hat theorem, uh, uh, using this idea of, of, of twisted affine, uh, GIT. Um, but I think that's my time for today. Thanks. Are there any questions? Yeah, so if, yeah, go ahead. if your x is degenerate and um, doesn't intersect z min in your projective space, um, can you just take the like lowest weight that intersects x? Or uh, yeah, so on the one, one thing that I one thing that I skipped over, which perhaps I should have said, is that you you really want x to be embedded in projective space using a very ample line bundle. So um, 
if you if you if the embedding from X into projector space is defined by a very ample line bundle, then it will always um, it will always intersect. Um, and so the minimal weight space for the GM action on uh, the minimal weight for the GM action on X will be the same as for the ambient space. Um, you're absolutely right. This is not in general going to be the case if you just chuck X into a projector space any old how. Um, but if you use if it's the total if it's the projectivization of the jewel of the you know the sections of a of a very ample line bundle, then then uh, th this works fine. Um, uh, yeah, could you maybe give some intuition for why in this you had theorem you consider the use? Sorry, I, I I didn't catch the question. Uh, sorry, uh, can you hear me now clearly? Um, yes, I think so. Okay. Uh, in this uh, you had theorem, uh, I was wondering why this U sweep of Z min is considered unstable. Because to me, like when I was thinking of it analogously with uh, the HKKN strata, I thought of it as sort of like polystable objects. But what, 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 what like, yeah. Uh -huh. So let, let me give you a, a maybe slightly cryptic answer by way of an example. So if you think about, um, let's say, um, vector bundles on a curve and you think about the, the GIT construction of vector bundles on a curve, then the HKKN stratification, um, if you set things up properly, coincides with the stratification by hardened Arasiman type. And the analog of X naught min is like the, sh the, the, the vector bundles of hardened Arasiman type, how, right? And the, uh, the, the, the Z min is the associated gradient of the hardened Arasiman filtration. So the map from X naught min to Z min is like taking the um, associated graded of a filtration. And um, what this means is that if you want to parameterize objects that genuinely are unstable, you're going to want to um, avoid the vector bundle being identified with its associated graded of its hard and narrow filtration. Because if you, if you do that, then all you're going to get is a moduli space of semi, a product of moduli spaces of semi-stable vector bundles. Everything in your moduli space is going to be a direct sum of semi-stable things. So the moduli space is just a product of moduli spaces we already know. So you don't learn anything new. So in some sense, the reason for this perturbation, this well-adapted linearization, is to deliberately make Z min unstable because all of the orbit closures, uh, you know, the, if you take a point to its limit, they're all going to they're all going to meet in in Z min. So you need to get rid of Zedmin because otherwise the orbits are going to get collapsed more than you'd like. You know, it's, it's very much the same as when you make projective space. You don't want a quotient affine space. You want a quotient affine space minus the origin because then you get a, a higher dimensional thing that's more interesting. Right. Yeah, thank you. This is, uh, in the, the statement of mediate scale, you said that the um, X quotient uh, by you has is projective of invariance, I think. Or is project project of invariance. Yes. Uh, does that mean that the algebra is finally generated? Um, does that mean that the algebra is what, sorry? Is the invariant <coughs> algebra is finally generated? Finally generated, yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah, so it's a, it's a uh, projective variety, so it's a scheme of finite type. Um, so one of the, yes, I could have, I could have stated that as, as one of the bullet points in the theorem, and maybe I should have, but it definitely, um, uh, it definitely follows from the BDHK uh, construction that you get um, uh, finitely generated invariants for, um, uh, for, for the U hat, yes. So does this mean that in examples of uh, Nagata type, uh, this mm -hmm. theorem cannot apply? Um, the, the examples of Nagata, what, sorry? Examples where uh, algebras are, invariant algebras are not finally generated cannot, you, you cannot apply this theory in some hypothesis space. Um, yeah, so I guess it's the, it's the, the difference between the U hat and the U, right? So one thing that I'll say tomorrow is that um, the, um, the, uh, <coughs> The U stabilizer condition, this um, this condition that uh, here, is um, what that's going to do. Plus the grading, is force the U action uh, to have a slice, roughly. So it's not in general the case that if you have an action, say of GA with um, trivial uh, stabilizers, that you get a slice for that action. But if there's a grading as well, then um, then you do. I mean, I'll, 
I'll say more about this next time and, and make that more precise, but that's roughly what's going on. Um, so the, uh, the, the presence of the grading is, is genuinely imposing some restriction on what the U action is, um, which is going to mean that it's, um, uh, it, it's locally trivial. So that's a, those are kind of special U actions, I suppose. Any other questions? So uh, everything we've said so far today, and I'm not quite sure we're going to be touching on this tomorrow, uh, X has just been a projected scheme over a point. Mm -hmm. How much of this carries over if instead you want to work more generally with schemes which are projected over a base? Uh -huh, yes, that's a very good question. So one thing I, yeah, maybe I should have said this actually, um, is that um, another example uh, of uh, Oh, sorry, another advantage, rather, of um, thinking about things in, in this way, in the way suggested by David Ridd, is that um, you can not only prove the UHAP theorem, but you can, you can generalize it. So um, the, 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 the cool thing about this perspective, which I'll maybe get into a little bit next time, is that um, you don't actually need Z-min to be projective. You just get, I mean, it, the, 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 the clue, I guess, is somehow, is somehow here. Um, that you, you'll end up with a quotient which is projective over whatever is playing the role of Z-min. And the way that you get projectivity in the U-hat theorem by using this proof is to say, the thing I have is projective over Z-min, and I know Z-min is itself projective because it's closed inside X, say. Mm -hmm. So there's a whole, um, there's a whole kind of uh, uh, beckoning series of generalizations of the U-hat theorem using this kind of relative perspective. And that's something that I've been... Um, uh, thinking about with um, uh, Eloise Hamilton and, and Vicky Hoskins, so we're we're going to be writing writing some stuff about that uh, soon, I think. But you're, you're absolutely right that, you, that another advantage of this perspective is that it does sort of generalize things out of the the, the pro projective world and into the kind of um, uh, well, you, you need a sort of affine morphism and you get something which is projective over the over the base. Um, what one other thing I should say while I remember, and I should have said this earlier, is that um, if you're interested in learning more about this or pretty much anything I've said in these lectures. There's a really good survey uh, paper by Vicky Hoskins, um, which I think maybe is called something like Moduli Problems in Invariant Theory, Old and New, or something like that. Um, anyway, it's a recent survey paper by Vicky, and it's really, really good. So if you want to learn more about this, then um, that, that would be the place I would, I would recommend you go. Thank you. Any other questions? And just a quick comment that uh, we saw in the lecture of Alistair Core exactly this twisted FIGIT happening. Sorry, I, I, I can't make out the uh, question. I'm not sure if you followed Alistair Core's lectures, but in this twisted FIGIT was exactly what, what happened in his lectures. <laughs> Sorry, that was that was unintelligible. Uh, I'm, I'm afraid our, our speaker here <laughs> yeah. is not. Um, <laughs> We're taking on in time. Can I ask if there are any questions from Ibadan? Any questions here? I don't think we do. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Josh. We'll see you tomorrow for the next talk, and we'll resume at 11.30.